from Second Samuel and uh, and David and and the Jerusalem aspect, the city of Zion, but also in Mark chapter six, where Jesus goes back to his hometown and a prophet is without honor and he sends the disciples out to uh, to heal. And I'm, and I'm sitting here and, and I'm listening to the question. I'm listening to, to Brian. You talk about every encounter with scripture is about conversion. And what you talked about in class was the second Timothy three passage for all scriptures inspired by God, profitable reproof, teaching, correction, et cetera, et cetera. So when you, when you talk about the two testaments and the new Testament be a completion of that, how, what is the way that you, you bridge those two together? Because if, if I'm reading, you know, what, what Mark is saying, and of course it's the first gospel that we believe was written, and, and what, what you're talking about through the Torah and the Pentateuch and what I'm reading for what David is and being a shepherd, I, and I alluded to that in one of the things from the class. Help me bridge those two together. Yeah, that's, I mean, obviously that's, that's a huge question and um, we, we may have to say, um, maybe even have to make a video about that, but I mean, a, a short answer is, is um, so you're preaching from the lectionary and you're going to use the gospel text this, uh, this week, right? And you just, yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have the Samuel passage there and read it too and okay. draw some similarities, but, but just it, it, that's, that's one of the reasons I got on tonight. So I want to see that in Luke's question, just kind of dovetailed into that for me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and it depends on the, the, it depends on the text. And so like, if you're preaching from the lectionary, you're going to read the Samuel passage and, um, and, and the worship also. So you have both texts. Like, so if you were going to primarily preach out of the Samuel text, you would, it, you would want to show how it lands in, the New Testament, because I mean, because you, I mean, I, you can't, uh, like in another class, I would have, if this was, a, uh, like we were doing an IBS two class where we're doing interpretation, I would ask this question, can a Christian pastor and a Jewish rabbi preach the same sermon if they're preaching on a, a book from, um, from the Old Testament? And wow. the answer should be no, um, I think, um, right. simply because even if it's the same text, there's a different trajectory that comes out of it. So like if you're um, a, a Jewish rabbi, you're going to run <clears throat> the teaching from, um, from the Tanakh um, through the uh, medieval Jewish commentaries, through the entire interpretive system that have been around in the, the rabbinic movement. So there's an angle there. If we're, since we're, we're Christians, we have the New Testament. So every sermon has to run through the gospel in some way. Now, that doesn't mean you force the gospel into every Old Testament text. The, the, the Old Testament has integrity on its, on its own, and, you're gonna, and, and it's going to have specific points. But you want to, you can't leave the reader, or in this case, you can't leave the audience kind of trying to figure out how it works out. You want to show how the themes um, eventually lend, end up in the, in the New Testament. And from your side, you're preaching primarily, it sounds like, from the New Testament, and you're just, you're just simply looking for roots in the Old Testament. Right, right, exactly. And so again, that, and, and the lectionary is a very, does everybody know what the lectionary is, by the way, that's on? Does anybody not know what it is? Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Because the lectionary is an outstanding resource that to, to help you with this very question. Because um, you may not, everyone knows what it is, but I don't know if everyone knows. Um, and forgive me if, if this is too simplistic, but um, not everyone does know this. The lectionary, the four texts are actually related, and they're intentionally paired together. And so it's a great way, especially if you're preaching out of the Old Testament and you're not sure what to do with it in terms of the New Testament. Um, you can go to a lectionary, um, like there's a great website, it's called Text Week, P-E-X-T-W-E-E-K, and it's a lectionary resource site, pulls together a lot of available online material for, for preaching and teaching, but it has a scripture index, so you can essentially find, you know, not every single passage in the whole Bible is in the lectionary, but a, a good portion of it is, and so you can see, like even if you're not a lectionary preacher, you can use the lectionary to help find texts that are complementary across the testaments that can then give you, you know, some um, um, a, con a, a canonical context 
to put the text in conversation. Now, a lot of what we're talking about, um, again, John's, I mean, this is your last class, I think. Um, if you were, a, and for everybody else who's in our actual degree programs at Asbury, our inductive Bible study classes, especially the second inductive Bible study class, which is the 600 level, um, it's, if you take, I encourage you to take an Old Testament one with that, um, we specifically work on evaluation application in that second IBS class, and we dead on hit on exactly what, um, what John's asking about. So there's ways to work that out within the curriculum. Um, I don't know. I could say more, John. Um, is that a, a, a yeah? That's that's start? good. I, I don't want to get too too far sidetracked, but I just with uh, with Luke's question, it just kind of fit into what what I had thought about today when I was doing some studying. All right. Thank you. All right, and Luke, let's go ahead and get your second question, and then we'll see if anybody else has questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if um, if the Old Testament hinges around the you know the Exodus event, um, and if we think about uh, the words that that um, Moses spoke to Pharaoh about, um, you know, God says, let my people go so they, they may worship me. Is it accurate to say that worship is a sign of freedom? Yeah, this is a really good question too, because this is, this is where the Hebrew language comes in. Um, it's interesting, the, the, the Hebrew word, I don't have my whiteboard, so I can't write up on the board for you, but um, <laughs> it's, it's um, the Hebrew word for worship um, also means serve, S-E-R-V-E, and actually the root underneath serve is where the word slavery comes from. And so in a sense, um, you could translate that, let my people go so they may serve me. And again, worship is a form of service, right? That's where even the word liturgy comes from. It's like service. I mean, it's, that's not a Hebrew word, but it's that, it's that idea. So there's actually a little bit of play on words. Um, and so in a sense, the whole issue of freedom. I mean, I like the way you've asked the question. It's, it, it's exactly the message of the Exodus. The message of the Exodus, um, we hinted at a little bit in class, it's not yeah. liberation from, it's liberation for, right? Right. Um, and it's, and that's, you know, and I, I alluded, you know, John's a Bob Dylan fan, so I did a little Bob Dylan thing. I, I use that old song, yeah. you got to serve somebody. Um, yeah. So in a sense, it's um, freedom from illegitimate service to a false God that is Pharaoh and all that Pharaoh represents to liberation into the service of the one true God, Yahweh. And that's going to involve, you know, worship, but in a sense, it's actually that calling um, the purposeful deliverance into the service of the Lord. And you even see this played out in the book of Exodus itself. I mean, I teach a class on Exodus, so I get down in the weeds in Exodus, but basically at the in chapter one of Exodus, the Israelites, um, they um, do labor for Pharaoh. And again, the word for labor is the same word that worship comes out of, serve comes out of, and slave comes um, out of. It's the noun. So like if you're hearing this in Hebrew, and you, may, you haven't probably taken Hebrew yet, but Hebrew is based, essentially the Hebrew language, you have all the, all, all the vocabulary are, involve um, three consonantal roots. And then whether the word's a verb, a noun, an adjective, it's by the vowels that you put onto it. And so they're hearing the same core word. And so they build store cities for Pharaoh. Well, at the end of the book, they build something for Yahweh. They build a tabernacle. And you see the same word. So they're, you know, so in a sense, they're never free at all. They're just, they're building stuff for Pharaoh, illegitimate God. They're released to serve the Lord. And they are doing that by actually building at the end. And so um, that whole theme of slavery, service, worship at all, um, it's played around with, with these words that in English we're getting totally different translations. Okay. Hebrews, it's very close and it would be, you know, completely obvious if we were, you know, Hebrew speakers. Right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Anybody else uh, have specific questions? Maybe if you could um, give, I'll oh, go ahead. I think it's you. Oh, okay. Uh, if you could maybe talk a little bit about Psalms. Um, I'm choosing to write my paper on that, so I'm a little more interested in um, how they separated those books and, um, you know, just a little bit about that, I think. Would be nice. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in my office tomorrow and shoot a video on the, kind of a, the, on the whole Psalter. I have um, some, but basically it's a pretty straightforward question. There's five books in the Psalms. Um, and 
they, those aren't just marked out in our English Bibles, but I mean, if you have your Bible, you can see book one, it's um, Psalms um, 1 to 41. Uh, book two is 42 to 72, book three, 73 to 89, book four, 90 to 106, and book five is 107 to 150. And if you just look at the, um, you just go to like Psalm 41, if you have your Bible handy, and just look at the very last verse of Psalm 41, and, and what you have is um, in, right into the editing of the Psalter itself is um, a little um, doxology um, um, embedded in there. So like Psalm 41, 13 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Um, that's both the last verse of 41, but it's really announcing this is the end of book one. And if you look at the end of... Um, if you go to the second book and look at 72, you get the same thing, get the same thing at 89, same thing at 106. Yeah. And then essentially the, the Psalter concludes with a five book doxology. It's Psalms one, or, I'm sorry, a five Psalm doxology, Psalms 146 to 150, where you have praise the Lord, both at the beginning and, and end of each of those Psalms. And then Psalm 150 verse six ends with, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So there's a structure that's embedded um, in the editing of the Psalter that allows, um, you know, our modern editions that book one, those are actually embedded into the, into the Psalms. Now in terms of the, you know, Bill Arnold deals with the Psalter right at the end of, um, of his, um, of his textbook, but um, uh, the Psalms probably are one of the last books that are actually coming together. As I mentioned in the Dead Sea, you have two different versions. They're the same, except one of them has 151 psalms. Um, it just adds an extra psalm at the very end. Um, let's see. Um, that's a little bit. I mean, I'm literally going to lay out a whole lecture, and I'll talk about the structure. And what, I, and what may surprise you, and I guess I'll give you a tease on the, on the lecture, is um, the Psalter has a structure to it beyond just this um, five books. It actually, it's thematically structured. And it's very, um, it's actually pretty fascinating. Those of you who have taken an inductive Bible study course, you can do a survey of the book of Psalms, and you'll find actual structures that hold the entire book together, that there's a message. And I can just tease it out pretty easy. Um, I'll do this quick. It'll, it'll be more in the video tomorrow. But the first two Psalms are an introduction. And if you have your finger in your Bible, you can look. There's no titles for either of the first two Psalms. Psalm 1 begins, blessed is, or happy are. Psalm 2 ends, happy are, blessed is. It depends on the translation. So you have like um, these two Psalms that start off the Psalter. One's about the Torah, Psalm 1. One's about the king. That's going to be a theme that we're going to see all the way through the whole book. Psalm 1 um, if you use the right translation, in the original Hebrew, it's singular, so it's like blessed is the man or the person. Um, to get inclusive language, a lot of the newer translations are making it plural, blessed are they. But it, that kind of distorts the fact that Psalm 1 is about a person, an individual. Psalm 2 is about the nations. So you basically have two psalms about security. The individual finds security to get to the world by the, by the Torah, by the scriptures. The future is guaranteed. And we don't have to worry about the nations because Yahweh has control of the nations. And in fact, Yahweh's installed his own son, the king, to rule from Zion over the nations. So you have this security set up. Then Psalm 3, for a long time, you get all these lament psalms, which introduce the theme of um, suffering, of lament early on. And the first 89 psalms are heavily dominated by laments, which are the psalms that are at crying out for help. And in fact, the lament is the most common psalm in the entire Psalter. It's not the majority, but it's almost the majority. But it's the, it's it's definitely the it's the most common genre. So um, it's the um, but it's not fifty percent. It's like in the forty percent. Now. Um, Psalm 146 to 150 ends the Psalter. Again, no titles for the Psalms. So there's no authorship. There's no, nothing added there. And so it, so it ends well. So it's basically this journey from security at the beginning to perpetual worship at the end of the Psalms. Um, and then in the middle, early on, you have these problems. You have these laments. And Book three, which is Psalm 88, ends with Psalm 88 and 89.
that represents the bottom for the Psalms. Psalm 188, or Psalm 88, if you read, it's the most depressing Psalm in the Bible, really, um, in the sense that this guy is sick <laughs> and suffering, and he does, and, and it just says at the end, darkness is my only friend. So this individual, there's no rest of <laughs> suffering, and he's really sad. Psalm 89 is Israel's messed up, the covenant's broken, and it, it laments that God has rejected Israel forever and broken his promises to Israel because they're in exile. So that's how the first part of the Psalter ends with this depression. And so, and how do you overcome a disaster? How do you overcome exile? Um, how do you overcome personal tragedy? Well, it's interesting, Psalm 90, the first Psalm in book four, it's attributed to Moses. It's the only Psalm that says it's a Psalm according to Moses. And it's like, how do you rebuild your life when it crashes and falls apart? You go back to your roots. That's what the Torah is. And so you have this Psalm of Moses kind of encouraging um, people. And then the next block of Psalms, I mean, this is being the video, from basically 91 up to 100, they're all about God as king. So how do you rebuild the roots when you go into exile, when the, when the earthly king has failed? You rediscover you're the Torah roots, and you remember that God is king. And basically, the second half of the Psalter then rebuilds Israel and ends up in this praise. So, I mean... That's a little taste what the longer video is going to show, but that's some um, some of the intentional movements um, that take place in the in the psalm. So, so all the psalms though are like the sacred hymns of the Israelite people. It's not just poetry; they're actually songs that were sung and they had music and all that stuff. Is that correct? <clears throat> yes, I mean it's it's mixtures of things. Like some scholars are going to argue, like Psalm one, for example, was probably written to be the first psalm because it's more like, uh, and even, um, but yeah, and it's, even if we date the Psalter itself fairly late, there's obviously really old Psalms, songs from the earliest times for Israel. You know, some of the Psalms could have been written more as literary pieces, like individual prayers. Um, but yeah, there's oh, okay. a lot of this, okay. it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, essentially. But I mean, yeah, these are worship songs that would have been, this is the prayer book from the Second Temple. Um, or okay, because I read that about it being the prayer book, and uh, so I was wondering, you know, is, is there a difference between a prayer and a song? And when I'm looking at Psalms, were all these sung, or were some of them just prayers that people said? And I was a little bit kind of confused on that. Yeah, I think you just want to assume, like, in a worship context, they're actually being chanted or put to music at some level. Um, and, you know, and so that's just okay. the way the okay. worship. So, yeah, so these aren't like just little, like, this isn't like a book of common prayer, but it's um it's a song prayer book. Kim Hill okay. is an artist, and she has a great um, rendition of Psalm 1. Oh. It's very, very good. So Kim, K-I-M, Hill, H-I-L-L. -L. I'll check that out. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, I got another question in the chat. Um, let's see, Wilma was asking, can I speak on the role of miracles in the Old Testament? Um, I guess I can. Is Wilma, Can I turn you on, Wilma, and ask you to clarify what you're actually asking? I'm going to unmute you. Is that, and so, um, or you have to unmute yourself, I guess, and you can ask me what you're really getting at or clarify that. Hi everybody! Outside of the road, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, well, outside of the uh, outside of the, the the Exodus and just the miracle that that was. What about the role? Of, how important were other miracle events of the Old Testament? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they um, miracles have a have a role. A lot of times, they they authenticate the authority of a person. I mean, that that's something that that happens. Um, Throughout the Old Testament, you'll have um, a miracle to authenticate somebody's authority. You also have, um, let's see, you said outside of Exodus. Obviously, Exodus is uh, God having using signs and wonders um, to essentially reveal something about God's power. Um, so those that those would be the miracles in Exodus. Um, Moses is able to do things like bringing water out of a rock. Well, it's God through Moses. And that, that's why Moses gets in trouble. But th those are miracles. So it's, again, ways of God showing his ability to have to, to 
provide for God's people food and water in the wilderness. Uh, several of the um, prophets do actual miracles. I think I may have mentioned in a class, I don't remember if it was a class last week or our class, but uh, one of the old, like the Elijah Elisha, they have the ax head that floats out of the, out of the lake. And I said, they used to ask them, um, yeah, and interviews that uh, did the axe head really float? Is and again that was a way of authenticating the prophet. Um, so I would say miracles are primarily to um, show something um, um, about the character of God, or as a means of authorizing a, um, a person who's been a, sent by the Lord to authenticate the message. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That 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 makes it puts. I, I like that. Okay. Yeah, we have a pretty, I got a lot of folks here now. Uh, let's see, let's see we, got, we have Cool Pad 3632A. I wonder who that is. It sounds like, sounds like a Star Wars robot. <laughs> <laughs> Even says C3 on the, uh, I'm getting spooked. We got a Google bot here making sure we're not causing problems, I guess. I don't know. This is not really not as far as related to what I think this is, but when, when do you need our thesis statement by to give us some feedback on that? Uh, can we do that after we take the exam or would you rather have that before the exam or? No, it's really any time in the summer. I mean, obviously for your own, um, to make it easy to do the research and stuff, it'd be better as, as soon as you can, but obviously after the exam, you still have over four weeks because the exams do one on the 21st and you'll have, I guess you actually almost maybe have five weeks actually pretty yeah. close to it. To the I was going to try to get it out to you that week of the exam, if that's okay. Yeah, the week, but the only thing is going to be if you send to me the week after the exam, I'm going to be on the cruise boat from the 22nd, 29th. So I'm not going to see it. So if you want feedback before <laughs> July 30th, so maybe week. next week, then we could, I could yeah. send you the thesis. Same. Yeah, that would be good. So, I mean, that's my blackout week right after the exams do. That's why I kind of put the exam there. So, um, I would, if there were any problems, I would know about it before I was gone. I don't want to, you know, the, I didn't want to make the exam do the next week and I'm not around if somebody's having right. an issue right. with tax. So, um, Very cool. but yeah, and, and we can even set up a, a Zoom conversation one on one, uh -huh. talk about it or talk on the phone or by email. So, but yeah, um, there's no, I mean, we can do it anytime. I, but I would just for just for the sake of research and getting your paper done while you want to do it as soon as um as soon as you have a decent thesis okay that sounds good sounds good luke i am your father <laughs> <laughs> i've got another question if no one else has one well it was funny there's still time so i've got at least a half hour so just put, okay. time for, we'll ask for answer whatever um, we've got and then just going through the old testament more um you know you could certainly I would give it an R rating, I believe. <laughs> so if the Old Testament has an R rating, does that kind of further prove its reliability? That if, that if it was trying to be a, a hoax or something, that it would be more uh, kosher or, or something like that? I don't know if this question's making sense. No, it is. I'm just trying to think, would we give the, um, would the New Testament have an R rating? I'm trying to think, probably, maybe not. But New Testament would probably be PG thirteen, right? But the, you, but yeah. obviously that you you give the Old Testament an R rating just because of the graphic nature, There's a lot of killing in it. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if it if that makes it more reliable, or is it, or just makes it, it just shows the times in which it was written that we have to be aware of. And and probably the scary thing. Well, actually, some of the stories are supposed to be scandalous because of the excessive violence, like the end of Judges, for example when they um but i mean it just kind of reminds us also of um those were tough times back in the ancient in the in the uh mm. in the world even you know and even the new testament i mean paul talks about his beatings and everything and that's if, if you made a movie about that and showed it that would be an r rating for the kind of yeah. violence even the crucifixion would have been you know mel gibson's movie was overkill uh, at some level but that that was r rated wasn't it the passion of the christ i don't know if anybody saw that when it came out yeah, a year ago. yeah it, it was uh rated r but I mean, and, and that kind of, at least the, that kind of activity, I mean, that's some um, horrifically disgusting torture of people. That's, that's kind of R-rated in a way too. Um, just not um, described in, R, in R-ratings though, you know, some of the Old Testament probably is. Well, the hearing killing of all the infants under two and, and, and all of the Egyptian children died, you know, Passover. That's, that's not family friendly, I would say. 
Yeah, or even Samuel killing a gag when Salt won't because he just first thing just goes kills the guy right in front of him. Or um, into Kings, they poke the last Israelites. They kill the ice kids in front of him and then poke his eyes out. So that was the last thing he gets to see his own kids being killed. It's always fun to somebody gets their eye poked out. Yeah, people are really nice. Those, that, those uh, <laughs> humans have, uh, in, you know, that, you know, it's really when you think about original sin and everything, um, it's interesting um, when you get the, the knowledge of the good and evil, it's, it's, it is fascinating that one of the first things that human beings figured out is that you could kill each other, right? So Cain kills his brother. I mean, that, that was like one of the first takeaways is the, that were, that were, um, were mortal creatures and that um, you can kill somebody. Because you think, I mean, other animals do murder, like chimpanzees kill people, kill each other once in a while. But um, a lot of animals, they don't, they usually just kind of, kind of have a fake fight for dominance and then they back off. But Well, David and Uriah, you know. Yeah, humans are just really good at killing each other. And so I think the Old Testament testifies to that. I've never heard it put that way. A lot of humans are really good at killing each other. Hmm. In sick ways, we'd have to add too. Yeah, yeah. Because it is taking, there's some, in, we've, been, we've come up with ingenious ways to um, torture people that really takes a creatively disturbed person to think of some of the things that we do to each other over the centuries. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's so disturbing about, you know, whether it be CSI or criminal minds, that someone in their mind concocted these ideas and these storylines. And that's, it is, it's disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. according to Solomon, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Yeah, my daughter was telling me the other day she was doing research on um, Dracula, the real Dracula, some guy named Vlad the Impaler, and he would he would impale um, Muslims basically. That was back. It was from the um, Eastern Europe. And that was pretty brutal. You know, we, we saw this in the 90s when, you know, Croatians, Serbians, and Bosnia and all that stuff, they had that ethnic cleansing piece. But that goes way back to when the two sides would just go at it. And, like, you can go to, like, the, the, the region today. And, like, when the Muslims came in to Serbia, they took um, – there were these Serbian freedom fighters. They actually made a, a tower. It's actually a tower of skulls, and it's still standing. It's people's heads. So they actually cut all these guys' heads off. And made a wall, made a tower out of it, and all that's left are all these skeletons. And they left it up to this day. So there's this real hatred. And so Vlad the Impaler comes in, and my dad, and I'm like, I'm, and I said, Mick, you please tell me if you didn't look up what impaling is. And she goes, I did, Dad. <laughs> and I'm like, Mick, you're never going to get that out of your mind the rest of your life. So, and, and I'm like, another sicko. But he was so um, up on impaling people that he even terrified the <laughs> Islamic Sultan who was known as one of the most violent and terrifying sultans of all time. And this guy was afraid of Vlad the Impaler because he walked in and there was like hundreds of people impaled and he even walked away. So I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff, but humans are really good at doing sick stuff. And so, yeah, there's some R-rated stuff in the Bible because it, uh, it, it, it paints a, a real picture of all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you stay in ministry long enough, you will, you will eventually be impaled on the horns of other people's sacred cows. Oh, my. <laughs> wow. That's a powerful statement. And th th there's, a, there's a word from a guy that's been, a, that's, that, that, who, who apparently has experienced that a few times, but that, that is true. It's, um, work, okay. uh, it's hard work, and it's, um, it does, there's a lot of sacred cows. Yeah, you which is a biblical hard. term, too, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I was going to ask you a question in uh, in our reading for for this week um, in Wright's book. He makes a he makes a comment, and he says the law was never meant to be a means of salvation. Yes, and he goes on and says salvation has always been and still is a matter of faith in the promises of God, which we now have in Christ. And I I heard a a sermon yesterday. Um, and it, it, it troubled me somewhat because the person said, people that have no hope cannot be led. And so I immediately thought um, of the Exodus, and, and I thought, you know, here are these people. Um, and then when they get and they're wandering in the desert, you know, 
you would have the background way better than I would to describe what kind of hope they have. And are they trying to find hope when Aaron does the golden calf, speaking of sacred cows, um, and, and, and what does right really mean by the law was never meant to be a means of salvation? I, I, my knee jerk is I don't agree with that, but I don't understand enough about the Old Testament law. Well, this is what I was, well, let me answer that part first, and I'm going to need a little bit more help with the hope question, because I didn't quite follow that, but the, 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 the right statement is pretty straightforward, and if you think about um, even my chart that I grew up on the whiteboard, right. when I had Exodus and Sinai, I said Exodus was grace, and Sinai was a response to grace, and so the point that the law wasn't a means of salvation was... Um, to, is, is exactly that. Israel was saved by the grace of Yahweh, um, and faith has always been in God's promises and trusting in the God who saved them from Egypt. And so the law is how do you respond to the grace that you've received? How do you live out in light of the salvation? And so that's the love God, love neighbor ethos. That's not the means of Israel. Um, because so the salvation comes before the law. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the law is, again, just the, the way that we live out as live our lives out as saved persons. If, if you're an Israelite, that's why it's so important to say that because that that's why in the New Testament, it's not antinomianism. Paul doesn't say, you know, should we uh, sin to the grace may have been or he assumes there's going to be a response of faithfulness. The big argument in the New Testament is... Um, you have to keep the identity markers that Israel had to keep in order to be a Christian. In other words, you have to be a Jew to be a Christian. And Paul is adamant, no, it's always been salvation by faith. And so it's the response. It doesn't mean that then you can go live your life any way you want. You just simply don't have to live it um, by, you know, being circumcised if you're male, keeping certain um, religious festivals, eating kosher food. It's, but you still have to keep the moral um, pieces of the law. So you have those long passages in Paul, like in thinking texts like in Romans 6, um, uh, Romans 12, um, Galatians, where you have, uh, Galatians 3 is a wonderful text where it talks about putting on, since we've been raised with Christ, we're going to put on a new self, and it um, lists some negative things you're going to be avoided, but then it talks about the positive things that you're going to articulate. Thank you. And what, talk about the, what was the hope question again? Yeah, it was, it was using um, Micah 6, 8 um, as part of a yeah. series, and then also 1 Corinthians 13, and talked about hope and the fact that if people run out of hope, then they can't be led. Um, and I just... I, well, I, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that seems like an interesting truth that seems to, like, be possible because people need some reason to believe that there's a future but is that a biblical concept or is that somebody just saying something and then trying to relate that back to the text in some way i, I, I think it was just a statement that was yeah. a broad statement because you know what i've seen where i minister in, in an urban area uh you have a lot of um uh, african-american uh crime and killing of one another and, and what I see is when people lose hope, um, they lose their direction. You know, I don't, I don't know that people that don't have hope can't be led. And I think it was a response to try to say, to, to bring something back to reflect upon the text itself as, a, as just a generalization. Um, and it just, it just kind of caught me. And I just thought, well, if the, if the people from, the Exodus had no hope, then why did they let Moses lead them? You know, yeah, and, and, and why did they wander for 40 years? Yeah, the hope was that God had promised they were going to take them to the promised land, so they did have hope. Their problem was that they lost hope because they had put it in Moses, so they assumed Moses was gone, so they needed another God to visibly lead them. So, but I wouldn't say it was a lack of, um, lack of hope. Um, and the gospel is supposed to be hope. I mean, that's what, in a sense, that's what, um, that's the grounding for the ethic. I mean, we have the hope uh, of new creation. We have the, the hope of um, ultimate security in Jesus Christ. I mean, so that, so that's kind of the underlying message. So um, I don't, I don't really know what to say other than that. 
I got you. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else have a question? Some of you are muted, so if you need, if those of you want, if you need to ask a question, oh, second, I see. Um, I live in a rural area, have a satellite internet. There's a storm. Oh, okay. It's a very loud bedtime here tonight, so I'm muting for the rest of the day. <laughs> Um, say, say you, 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 you were a little bit, uh, didn't come through loud and clear. I heard you say, so say it again. Um, I said it's a really loud bedtime here tonight. So it's muted for your sake. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, I, oh I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, it's no problem too. So because, yeah, yeah. You have a, a young man, a, a young child who's asking really hard questions at age six. So you're going to have your hands full as he gets older. Well, and it was funny when you were talking about um, how violent the Old Testament is, like it's a cartoon, it's PG, but it goes like in very rough pictures, the killing of all the babies. And if you know the story, you catch it more. Um, but yeah, when you actually just step back and the violence is amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. But my three-year-old keeps saying that he's Pharaoh and he likes to be a bad guy and he's Pharaoh. And then he keeps going, let my people go. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> it is, and kids like it. When I was a kid, my favorite book of the Bible was Judges because I liked all the battle stories. I used to like war movies and stuff when I was growing up. So I thought that was the coolest book. Now I think it's the craziest book. So I, that's just, I've just changed. <laughs> Um, any, does anybody else have any, any, any questions, um, be about the reading? I mean, we'll have our discussions online. I think I answered most of the things that had been typed up as of a couple hours ago that were in just in the discussion, um, in the discussion form. A lot of you were asking about myth and I did, um, I posted, if you have time and you want to watch, um, I found a video with Dr. Oswald. I've seen it before. He actually goes over his own book. He's, he talks about 50 minutes and lays out his whole kind of, um, thesis and it's um it's very good um he's a he was he's an excellent teacher and he's like 75 or 76 he doesn't really look like and he's just as uh, sharp as you, as he ever was i really liked your uh, uh as luke alluded to it earlier uh chapter five in your book i thought the the title was was very very good learning to speak human yeah. um because it seems humans have lost civility in one another especially at this day and time. And, and gosh, what a, what a sad uh, thing that you had to move into a house that the grass was over a foot high. Boy, that would have killed me. <laughs> I think I'd have called somebody to cut the grass on that one. <laughs> well, I think at that point in my life, I couldn't hardly afford it. I mean, literally, when I moved, when I, what, this is actually true. I always say that God always kind of takes care of you, but, you know, you, it's not like um, – like my experience is it's just it's always been just in time. So like literally I moved to Florida like I think on July 18th and I got my first paycheck from the seminary on July 31st, like one day before the mortgage was due and I was coming out of the PhD program. So I like I had zero cash. So uh, it was I was I, you know, I had to buy a mower and that that was pretty much it. Then a couple weeks later I got uh, had you know, got had got paid and um, so that was like, well, not going to get way ahead this time, but I did have, I made it and had enough. I had enough just to get uh, savings just to make it to July 31st. And that's exactly where I had to make it to. A cloud by day and fire by night, man. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I've got to go. I've got somewhere to be in 30 minutes. So I'm going to check out. It's good to see y'all. Yeah, and uh, the next one's two weeks from tonight. Is that correct? Yeah, and this looks like it was a good time because we have a really good turnout. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's good. And, and that last, um, when we meet in two weeks, um, I mean, the test will be posted. Uh, but, I, you know, we can talk. If you have, I mean, because nobody can – if you open the test, you have to take it. So, um, we can do a little review on the 16th if you have specific questions. Um, and, um, and then answer any other questions that you have. Again, I think we all know the dates. And so you got a couple more reading assignments. That's that's wrapping up. I'm going to open up. Um, um, I'll put the rest of the videos up tomorrow. I'm going to, I mean, it's assuming everything works tomorrow, I'm going to be in my office. I'm going to shoot the last Psalm videos and I'll open up a place and put the final reading and stuff. Um, and if you have questions about your papers, you know, you, you can ask them here if you want to. Um, or, you know, just send me an email or we can have a private um, conference uh, too, so. Um. Awesome, thank you guys. Y'all have a good evening.
Yeah, thanks. thanks. Take care. See you, John. So, Dr. Russ, I've got one question. Okay. I, I am like, I can't even narrow my focus down on a thesis for my paper. And I'm wondering if you had, like, the list that you gave is great, but it still feels really blank to me. So, any advice on ways in which to just kind of at least help us me focus my thinking about a topic? Yeah, I mean, if, if the easiest topic to write on is if you have a favorite book in the Old Testament, write the paper, the purpose of blank, okay. and then you can research that in a fairly straightforward way just by, you have to get access to commentaries, but in, in the introduction of the commentaries, and you can read other um, introductions of the Old Testament, you can get introduced to the scholarly literature, and, and that's a way to... Um, have a kind of a coherent topic. Um, it's still broad, but you can, but it's, um, it's doable because you're just focusing on the purpose. Um, so that's an easy way. Another thing would be just um, what, what, what has really interested you in the class around your reading. Um, and once you can name that, it's probably better to have a topic before you do the thesis because mm -hmm. um, a thesis can emerge and the thesis will just be the, the sliver. I mean, the, the smaller part of, of the topic that you find, but it's probably first start with a topic that you're actually genuinely interested in. And then I, you know, try to find it in the, like Arnold's book is pretty comprehensive. It's, it's pretty narrow. It doesn't say very much about anything actually, but it covers everything at least at, at some in, but that could give you, you can look at it for there and just kind of see, he does, he has some bibliography too. So there's some ways to get started. And again, if you have a topic and you're not exactly sure, we can have a conversation about um, um, that too. And I can say no problem. We only have, I think there's only 13 people in this class. So it's not like there's 50 and you're going to be standing in line forever to talk to me. So there's plenty of, um, yep, yeah, this is, um, you know, I would have, I was expecting to get closer to 20 or even 30 in the class. So um, that, I mean, it's perfect size. I don't have as many papers to grade. It's better for you all because you have better access. So I take it, I would take advantage of it. Cause you know, sometimes uh, <laughs> I was looking at my classes in the fall. I already have in the three classes. I have, I have like 85 students in three classes in the fall already. And so, you know, and I like have, um, I think I have 36 in the three classes I'm teaching right now. And one of those classes is advanced this summer, so it's really small, but I mean, it's, you, the classes can be pretty big sometimes. So this has been a, um, unusual. Okay, thank you. Right, and several of you, I mean, this isn't a plug for my own stuff. Um, well, it kind of is, but several, like some of you said you'd like to show, let share that Realigning with God book with lay people, um, and that's fine. Um, but that book was, I wrote that book really for pastors, essentially, um, or people that are more leaders. And it's specifically, I mean, for this, if you like the whole book, it's fine. But if you really want them to read essentially part one, which is my survey of the um, Old Testament and New Testament, um, I would recommend my seedbed book, Invitation, which really covers part one of Realigning with God, but specifically written for lay people. And it's actually a Bible study, and it can be done with a group even. Um, so um, if you like Realigning with God and want to give it somebody, I'll be really happy because it's my book and I'm really proud of it. But if you mostly want to give it for the first half of the book, I would get, get the book Invitation. And, and actually, Invitation is cheaper too, but it's if you like the second half of realigning with God, which has some of the um, method stuff and how to apply it, obviously then you need to use realigning with God. But if you just like the survey, the whole Bible and the diagram that I put up on the board in class, that's covered specifically designed for lay people, even designed for people that don't know hardly anything about the Bible, it's invitation. Now yeah, someone had... gave me. Go ahead, David. Go ahead, Luke. Okay. All right. Well, somebody gave me a copy of that book, Invitation, after preaching at their church. Uh, then they sent me a, a note with it that said there was a DVD, apparently, that went with the book that she did not any longer have. Uh, maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> no, actually, Invitation is a Bible study that I do um, for, that I did for Seedbed and Seedbed, if you don't know, it's seedbed.com. That's um, Asbury's, we're, it's our publishing house. Um, as Bible study resources. I'm actually, okay. I'm the editor for the Bible, all the Bible studies um, there as well. But invitation was our, oh. um, is our, it's my study of the whole Bible. It's 10 weeks that essentially teaches the diagram that we put up in the DVDs um, or you can get just um, 
digital download right off of like Vimeo. We have a, a secure site where you can just stream it. Um, each there's 10 30 minute lectures by me that cover the different chapters and most of it's the old testament so it's very much and in fact okay. um, um yeah the the, the 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 that slideshow the shorter version that was just called the missional review of scripture that i had that i used some in the class um that's that's that that, right. that, most, that slide shows the outline for realigning with god mostly but I also, those, that's what I cover on the invitation book in a, not exactly the same way, but in a similar thing. So it, it's a, it's heavily Torah ends with the new Testament and covers the, um, the most the, the kind of the highlights of the Bible, but that was designed to actually be used as a study for lay people in a local church, though it could be read by yourself if you wanted to with, with video content too. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Luke, did you have another question? Yeah, I'm trying to remember it. Um, I didn't write it down. Okay. I can remember it. Okay. Anybody else have anything tonight? Okay. Um, well, um, we don't have to uh, prolong. Again, I'd, I'd answer whatever questions you have. If you have other ones, just post them, and, or we can bring them back in two weeks. Um, this is good. Should ask. I should have asked before I did this. I, I taped when I started answering questions. Does anybody care that they're on the video? Because you're going to be on it. I mean, if I mean, I, I don't. I don't. I think they records everything. So does anybody have any awful? And it would just be for our class, and it disappears after the class is over anyway. So. Um, Anybody actually, you don't, I don't even embarrass you. If you have an objection to being on the video, send me an email, then it just won't ever, we'll just put the audio up or something. So um, I'll just leave it at that so you don't have to even do it. So if you have any problem with being on the video, just shoot me a note. Though so everybody mostly just looks like, you know, they're like this big on the video, so it's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> and, and my favorite video, I think, is still Luke's because there's like a skeleton back on the wall because you, you didn't cover up what it looked like. The, the, oh, there's the whole, oh boy, now there's the whole video. Oh my. Yeah, yeah. I'll get over here now. I won't show my daughter. She likes animals too much, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least, at least Fluffy the Poodle wasn't up there. Yeah, pe people have their, um, they have their, their, their thoughts. So, yeah. Well, you, you just actually, you know, you do what my, you know, I like meat and most, but I don't ever, but I really don't want to kill an animal, so I shouldn't be eating it. So at least you, um, you eat what you've done it with yourself. And so that says something about your connection with the earth, at least. So well, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll tell you this. I want to put this on the part on the video, by the way. This isn't going to be <laughs> good. I have some friends who, who have never hunted, and, and when I take them, it changes the way they, they view meat to, to see it, it's just, um, whether you go to McDonald's, whether you go to Olive Garden, something had to die for you to eat. Yeah. And so it, it changes your perspective on what it means to, to eat food. And it really, I, I find it incredibly holistic. Um, it's, it's a kind of a sacred act. And um, it is one, one of the things that um, a friend and I go a lot and we're reminded that, you know, all creation is groaning and that, that too, that one day this will come to an end A new creation. I don't believe there'll be hunting, obviously. Um, but, but yeah. Well, it's, it's very Old Testament because, you know, that's the thing in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, essentially every time somebody ate meat, it was, it was actually in a worship service. Essentially, you're sacrificing the animal. Um, that's what, and so all the meat would have been, and, and that's what the issue in the New Testament is, that all the meat sacrificed to altars would have been sacrificed to other deities. So there was a, a conscious question. And in, in the book of Deuteronomy, that's the first place in the Old Testament where you have what's known as kind of profane slaughter. In other words, you can just kill something without it being a sacrifice if you're too far away from Jerusalem. So it's um, rooted in there. So anyway, um, if anyone, does anyone have any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just say a prayer and uh, we can call it an evening. But uh, thanks for coming. It was, this was great. I was, um, I didn't know if we'd just get one or two people, but we got, I mean, we got over half the class. So it's great to see everybody. And um, again, we had a great, uh, I had a great time a couple of weeks ago. It was a really fun group. So grateful for all of your interest and, uh, I'm here to serve, so if you have questions or anything I can help you with, let me know. So why don't we, why don't we pray together? Yeah, Lord, thanks for today. Thanks for a chance to have a chat here on technology in all the different places, all the different states that we're actually in right now. 
Uh, we pray for every person in our class. Uh, guide us, help us to complete our work, continue to learn all the things that you have for us. And uh, we pray, Lord, uh, your blessing on each family and, and community of faith is represented here. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, 